my extreme pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speaker today. Attorney General Gray Wall is here at Woodrow Wilson Middle School to speak to you about the importance of being a good citizen and a good person. As he speaks, I encourage you to think of ways that you can make a difference in your school, community, and state just as he has. He is a great role model and example of what it means to be a good citizen and inspire change in the world. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Attorney General Graywall. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, and good morning, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, I am so incredibly excited to be here. Uh, I want to thank Principal Katoya for, for inviting me. Uh, and I want to thank my good friend Andrew Carey, the Middlesex County Prosecutor, for joining me this morning. So what I thought I would do before we get to the questions is really just tell you a little bit, even though you've learned about it in your social studies class, tell you about what I do and, and how I got here. And, and, and then talk to you about the importance of, of being good citizens and about the importance of being engaged and, and to talk about a little bit about citizenship and the Project Citizen citizen uh, uh, thing that you're working on with Rutgers. So the Attorney General's office, and I think you, you studied it in social studies class, uh, is a big organization. Uh, we have a lot of responsibilities. Uh, the Attorney General is the chief law enforcement officer for the state of New Jersey. So what that means is that I have responsibility for all the prosecutors in the state and for all the cops in the state, all 30,000 of them. And that means I set the policies, and I set a lot of the directives, and I set a lot of the priorities for what our cops and what our prosecutors do across the state. And so that means I could also investigate charge crimes myself or work with our county prosecutors, like the Middlesex County prosecutor, to do that. Or if I think there's something going wrong in a particular police department here in, in Middlesex or in another county, I could work with the county prosecutor, or I could work on my own to improve that by taking over the department or by working with our county prosecutor's office to put some more oversight over that department. Or if I think there's a particular issue that is really affecting New Jersey, like the opioid crisis, I can work with all of law enforcement across the state and say, hey, this is what we're going to focus on this year, or, or this is the initiative that we're going to take to really put a stop to the, the uptick in, in, in drug-related deaths in the state. So it's an extraordinary responsibility, but that's just part of it. I have responsibility also to be the chief legal officer for the state. That means I'm the lawyer for every state agency, from the governor to the uh, Department of Environmental Protection to the, the Secretary of State, everyone. Whether it's a question about how elections should be run as we come to November, or if there's a question uh, on environmental matters, or if the governor's office has a legal question, we have 500 lawyers that I'm responsible for that answer those questions. So it's the chief legal officer and the chief law enforcement officer. But that's not all. We have 13 divisions and 8,000 people that I'm responsible for. And they include everything from the state police to the division of gaming. And believe it or not, I'm also responsible for all the race horses in the state, all the racing that happens at our racetracks. And I didn't know that walking in the door. So I had to learn pretty quickly on, on, about horse racing. And I'm responsible for the casinos. And I'm responsible for all the fights that happen in the state. If there's a professional boxing match, that's licensed by our office. So it's a, it's a pretty wide range of responsibilities, and, and it's a pretty awesome responsibility, and it's a pretty unique opportunity to really just do a lot of good. Because, again, we touch so many different people and so many different issues from the law enforcement side of the house to all those other issues that affect New Jersey, from the environment to, to all a uh, host of things, like the election coming up and how that should be run. And so it's something that, that I really take to heart when I go to work every day, that I have a motto that I just want to do every day the right thing for the right reasons in, in any one of the issues that I touch. Uh, and it's, it's a unique opportunity that I never, when I was sitting in your seats, thought was possible for someone like me. And so I want to talk to you just for a moment about my journey to this position, how I got here. And I think my journey starts really with my parents' journey. You see, my, my parents, maybe like some of your parents, took an extraordinary leap of faith, an extraordinary leap of faith almost 50 years ago, 
They left a, a country in India to come here to the United States where they knew no one. They had no relatives, they had no friends here. They, they, they barely spoke the language, but they had this notion that there was something here in America, the notion of the American dream, that if you came to this country at that time, and even now, that if you're ready to work hard, if you're ready to study hard, that no matter where you came from, what you look like, or how you worship, that you could really succeed in this country. And in many ways, they realized that dream. And they had a son, and they raised a family, and they taught me those same things. That if you work hard, if you study hard, anything is possible for you. And, and that's, that's, I very much believe that. It's not always been easy. It's not always been easy. Along the way for me, there have been challenges. I have dealt with racism. I have dealt with bullying. I have dealt with so many hindrances in, in, in that progress, whether it's folks telling me that I, I can't do a job because I don't look American enough, or I can't assume a certain role because I don't fit the image. There have been obstacles, but what has always been true is that if you just put your head down and you're ready to work hard, all doors will open for you. But to me, to me that, that to be the recipient of that American dream, that benefit that my parents got when they came here, also means that I had to give back. Right? There is a, a, a motto that President Kennedy repeated often, and, and, and it comes really, I think, from the Bible, but he said, to whom much is given, much is required. Right? And as a recipient of that American dream, the benefits of my parents' extraordinary sacrifice to come here and everything that they were able to achieve in this country, I thought also required me to give back. And for me, there was no better way to give back than to choose public service. And so I chose, after I got my law degree, after I worked in private practice, that I wanted to really start giving back. In part, to pay back that debt that my parents incurred by coming here and, and, and being the recipients of that gift, but also to also change people's perceptions of what it meant to be an American. That I wanted to get into public service to be a prosecutor. That's what it was for me to do a job where I could go into court every day looking the way I do and believing the way I do and say that I represent the United States in a particular case. And, and I thought that was important because I thought I could change people's minds and maybe change perceptions and, and change people's stereotypes of, of, of what it meant to be American. And so I became a prosecutor at a very young age at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Brooklyn. I was a federal prosecutor, so I put away bad guys in Brooklyn. And there were a lot of bad guys there. I put away drug dealers. I put away people who committed financial fraud. I put away people who committed health care fraud, people who committed theft and, and, and violence. And I did that for a long time. And, and, and I just continued to do that as best as I could for about four or five years. And then I moved to the U.S. Attorney's Office here in New Jersey. And, and I continued to do that here. And, and as I did that, and as I did my job, I felt like I was making a difference. I was making my community safer, but I was also changing people's perceptions, I thought, of what it meant to be American, what it meant to do these frontline public service jobs, and, and maybe promoting understanding that you could look different like I do, but still be part of the fabric of this country. And so at the U.S. Attorney's Office, I was, I was a supervisor. I rose through the ranks. I worked with Andrew over there. And one day I got a call from Governor Christie, who I didn't know at the time. I answered the call, and he asked me if I was interested in interviewing to be the Bergen County prosecutor. That's where I live. And that's the chief law enforcement officer for Bergen County, New Jersey. And, and you know, I really didn't know what that meant, so I said, can I get back to you? And I went and I did what you probably do when you don't know something. I went to Google, and I tried to figure out what the Bergen County prosecutor did. And I said, you know what, this is pretty cool. That gives me that same opportunity to make a difference and, and to show people that you can look differently and believe differently and still do these public service jobs and, and, and that are so associated what is, with what it means to be American and change hearts and minds and, and, and explain to people who you are and that you're still part of the, the fabric of this country, a very high profile position. And I took that position. I interviewed for it, I got it. And for two years, I was a chief law enforcement officer for the biggest county in New Jersey, most populous. And, and I loved it. I loved 
and, and I was doing great things. We were, we were addressing the opioid crisis. We were reducing violent crime. We were making our community safer. We were improving police community relations. And you know that week when you guys get off from the teachers convention? It's in November, right? The, the Jersey week at Disney, they call it, where everyone from New Jersey goes out to Disney World. So, you know, two years into my job, I, I take my kids down to that Jersey week at Disney. I have three girls. 10, 8, and 6. And I'm with my then uh, four-year-old on the line to the Little Mermaid, you know, that undersea adventure. Uh, and, and I'm waiting in line, and I get a call. This is in November of 2017. And it's from a number I didn't recognize. Uh, and, and the person on the other line said, Prosecutor, this is, uh, I'm not going to use his name, this is so-and-so from Governor-elect Murphy's campaign. Are you interested in interviewing for the position of Attorney General. I thought it was a friend of mine like Andrew playing a prank on me, uh, and, and I didn't tell him to, you know, screw off or anything like that, uh, thankfully, but it was somebody from the campaign, and I said, sure, I'd love that opportunity. And they said, well, can you come in tomorrow morning? And I said, well, that's going to be hard, because I'm down here at the Magic Kingdom, and, and you know, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to get to Newark by tomorrow morning. Uh, but so we set up an interview, and I went through a process. And what they told me is that they were really impressed with what we were doing in Bergen County, how we were addressing issues in the community, how we were promoting police community relations, how we were addressing the drug epidemic, and how we were addressing violent crime. And so I went through an interview process. And, and, and that process ultimately led to me being nominated on December 12th of 2017 to be the 61st Attorney General for this state. Again, nothing that I ever imagined that I would achieve in my life, nothing that I ever sought out, but to me it was a continuation of just sort of changing people's perceptions about giving back. That, that started as a, a line prosecutor in Brooklyn, that continued to the U.S. Attorney's Office in New Jersey where I supervised the unit, that continued to be the Chief Law Enforcement Officer in Burton County, and then the opportunity to do this at a statewide level, to be the face of law enforcement, is something I couldn't turn down. And, and luckily for me, the governor uh, chose to nominate me, the Senate confirmed me, and I started on January 16th. And, and it's an incredible responsibility. In addition to everything that, that we were doing, uh, that I told you at the outset, we are doing so much when it comes to meaningful issues on a federal level, too. You know, whether it comes to the immigration debate, whether it comes to environmental issues and consumer protection issues, in addition to whatever happens here in New Jersey, we're also involved on issues at a national level dealing with things coming out of Washington and, and trying to make sure all of you and your families are protected regardless of whether it's a threat to our economy, our environment, our, our way of life, or to our immigrant communities. So it, it is an incredible responsibility, which I, I really, I really, really take a lot of pride in doing well each and every day. And, and if there's a piece of advice that I could give to each of you, it would be this. No matter Every attorney general, every county prosecutor, every assistant U.S. attorney, uh, every public servant started off as a student, much like yourselves. And, and, and the thing you always have to keep in mind, when, if you want to achieve these positions, if you want to get involved in public service, is that you have one chance, really, to, to make your reputation in life. That the world we live in, as big as it is, is very small. And and the reason I say that is that I didn't know Governor Christie, I didn't know Governor Murphy, I did not know the people who hired me along the way, but when they did their due diligence, they talked to somebody who knew me or knew my work. And, and, and I think what I did was I really developed a reputation of being honest in everything I do, being straightforward in everything I do, of being a hard worker. And I solidified that early and I, and I took pride in it. And that's what I would encourage each of you, is to take pride in your work, take pride in your reputation, take pride in how you treat each other, because as big as this world is, it is very small as you move on in life, as you get into college, as you get into the professional world. And when folks start asking, hey, how's so-and-so? How do you think they would do in this job? That's what we do when we're hiring people and talking about people or, or looking for people, uh, candidates for, for meaningful positions. You want them to be able to say, that's a good person. They treat people with respect, they treat people with kindness, they work hard, they're somebody you could trust. And, and you really, 
you really get one shot at doing that. And so I would value every interaction you have with your teachers, every interaction you have with your friends. And I tell my own kids, you gotta try to win every interaction. That means just treating everybody as best you can in that moment. Because that's how you sort of build your reputation and that stays with you. And, and if you develop a reputation early of cutting corners, of being dishonest or, 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 or someone that can't be trusted, it'll catch up to you. And, and, and so take really a lot of pride in yourselves and, and in your interactions with your friends and the reputations that you solidify because you never know. The next attorney general, the next county prosecutor, the next assistant U.S. attorney, the next governor could be sitting in this room. And, and so I want to encourage all of you to do the best you can to become good citizens, to become engaged. Uh, and again, going back to my parents' journey, you know, participation to me is the price of citizenship and I'm participating through my public service. So thank you for having me. I'll answer your questions, but I want my friend Andrew Carey to say a few words too. He is the top cop in this county. And so if anything goes wrong here, blame him, <laughs> don't blame me. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Thank you for having me. Thank you to the principal. I very much appreciate that uh, my good friend Gravier gave me a call and asked me to join him today. It is my pleasure to be your county prosecutor. I'm one of those 21 that he mentioned. Uh, I take care of Middlesex County as best I can for him. Everything he said is absolutely true. And I, might, I just want to tell you he's the best man for the job. I was working at the U.S. Attorney's Office when I had heard that he was considering coming to our U.S. Attorney's Office. I walked into the U.S. Attorney, that's the federal prosecutor's office, and I told him, you gotta hire this guy. And then when I got tapped to be the prosecutor and I heard that they were thinking about somebody new for Bergen, I made a call and I said, you gotta hire this guy. And then I had no idea they were gonna tap him for Attorney General, but that's the best guy for the job. And I'm very proud to work with him. I, I look forward to seeing what he does next. Um, like Kabir, I am extremely fortunate to be in this position. I came from a family of people in the entertainment industry. I'm the only lawyer in my family. Um, but I got to do the right thing along the way. And it's very nice in the state to be recognized for that and to be able to be your prosecutor. So you learn in school, there's three branches of government, right? Executive, legislative, and judicial. We are of the executive branch, which is supposed to be law enforcement. So as a Middlesex County Prosecutor, I am in charge of my office, which at once an arrest is made or an investigation has concluded, we will bring the person to court and tell the judge what they have done. And I'm also the Chief Law Enforcement Officer. I'm in charge of 1,900 of the 30, what was it, 33? 35. 35,000? Uh, Jeez, cops uh, throughout the land of New Jersey. So that's my job. But much of what law enforcement is has nothing to do with enforcing the law. I'll let you in on a little secret. I don't like putting people in jail. It does not make me happy. Jail is a horrible place. You don't want to have to send somebody to jail, but when that person is so dangerous that they're gonna hurt somebody else, sometimes that's the only place. But a lot of what we do are events like this the greatest part of Middlesex County is the diversity. I look around this room, there's an incredible amount of diversity and it's a lot of fun for me. I get to deal with the community groups. I go out, I meet with the different groups, I see what their concerns are. We get to work on things. We're working on the opioid crisis, we're working on gangs. I'll be teaching a class uh, to school administrators soon on gangs and gang activity. And I look around here and I see the future of Middlesex County and it makes me happy because I see a lot of different faces and people seem very involved. And when it comes to working in the community, I encourage you to, to do whatever you can. Whatever it is that's your thing, get involved. I'm sure I speak for Kabir too. When we look to hire somebody, whether it be a detective, a support staff, or an attorney, I want to see that that person is dedicated to public service, that their primary goal is to help people in any capacity, whatever it is that you do, do it well. And in eighth grade, it's not too early to start. I know when you get to high school, because I have two high schoolers, there's community hours and this and that, and some kids kind of budget, and some kids really get involved. You need to get involved. If you see something that needs work, work on it. Reach out to people, reach out to your elected officials, reach out to your appointed officials, 
uh, Lake Revere, so you know how I got here. Uh, I got a call from Governor Christie, and because I worked with him at the U.S. Attorney's Office when he was the U.S. Attorney, that's the federal prosecutor, and then afterwards uh, I got confirmed by the Senate. As you look to build your resume, as you look to work in your community group, knowing I'm speaking to eighth graders, I cannot emphasize this enough. Be careful on social media. You've heard it from others, and I will tell you. If you do something stupid on social media, whatever the platform, it's up there, and you can't get rid of it. I have tried to hire detectives and attorneys that once we, we go on social media, we see what they're up to, and I've withdrawn the position. It'll haunt you the rest of your life. Be very, very careful on social media. Just to have my daughter make fun of me, I asked her, are you snap facing? Are you face chatting? And I, I get it purposefully wrong just so I look like a dad. And I do make a lot of dad jokes, and I'm proud of that. So get involved. I, it's great that you're in this class. You have wonderful teachers and wonderful principal. And it's my pleasure to be here today. And uh, if there's any horrible questions, your beer will be the one answering. <laughs> All right, let's do the question. Okay, so I'm Divya, and my question is, what's the most powerful change you made? The most powerful change that I've made, huh? Um, so I, I think a couple of things. It depends on the, the area. We've been in, in office for about nine months. Uh, and I think uh, early on, what we wanted to do was really uh, promote trust between law enforcement and community. Uh, because we saw that there was a lot of mistrust and gaps uh, between law enforcement and community uh, across the state. So uh, early on, we promoted uh, a number of policies to encourage communication between law enforcement uh, in the communities they serve. So we started a project called 2121, a 21 county 21st century policing tour where we required all of our county prosecutors, including Andrew, to hold four community meetings to come into the community at least once a quarter to talk about important issues. And then we also put into policies, uh, put into place policies uh, that really call for more accountability with law enforcement. So I think that was a big change. Uh, the other thing is on the opioid crisis, I would say, we made a big change where we, we took a different approach that people who are suffering from a disease of addiction, we were trying to get them help, like Andrew was saying, instead of putting people who are suffering in jail, we wanted to give them treatment options. So I think one of the biggest things then, in, in really broad strokes, is that we changed the way we think about issues, we, we try to promote more trust, and you know, moving forward, we'll, we'll have new initiatives for next year, but I would say just sort of changing the attitude and the dialogue, uh, increasing the dialogue is something that we did over the last eight or nine months. Great question. So, uh, I'm still open. I have two questions. The two questions. questions. So the first one is being NJ, uh, is being NJ Attorney General a hard job? Is it a hard job? Yeah, it, it, yes. Uh, when you have 8,000 people you're responsible for, someone's going to do something wrong. Uh, so uh, it's a hard job because you, no matter what you think you're going to get done in the morning when you come to work, uh, there's always some crisis, in, and, and that takes over the rest of your day. So uh, it's, a, it's a hard job, but uh, it's a really rewarding job at the same time. Okay. So the second question is, could an introvert like me assume the role that you're playing right now? <laughs> so, so here's a little secret. I'm an introvert, too. Yeah, so I, I think that's right. I mean... I think my, my family will tell you that I'm a pretty quiet and shy person, but I think when, when you get into these roles, you have to just learn how to be in front of larger audiences. So I think you could do it, and you probably have the perfect personality to get it done. So, yes. You're standing up here right now. Yeah, you did a great job. <laughs> Naturally, we'd be sitting in the back, yeah. hiding. Yeah. Which way? Um, so, my name is Danny, and my question for you is, what have you learned about New Jersey during the past year of you being Attorney General? Oh, uh, it's a big state. As small as it is, it's a really big state. Uh, today, uh, I left my house to come here, which, which is, took me about an hour. 
then I'm going to go from here to Camden, and then I'm going to go from Camden to Philadelphia, then I'm going to come from Philadelphia back to, to Woodbridge, which is right here. Uh, so we put a lot of miles on our car. It's a big state. Uh, it's an incredibly diverse state. Uh, and we have 9 million people. We're one of the most diverse states in the country. Uh, and here's the other thing that I've learned. For whatever is going wrong in the rest of the world, we're doing things right in New Jersey. Uh, our government, sometimes it might not seem like it, operates much better than the rest of the country and much better than the federal government. Our law enforcement officers are among the best in the country, if not the best. Uh, we talk about improving relations between law enforcement and community. We have good relations. We just do need to do a little bit better. And so I think I've, I've been really impressed by those things, uh, in addition to just how many good people there are who just want to serve. Uh, and and you know, that's what you guys are doing in this project. So Don't feel too bad for him. He gets, he, the guy, there's a guy, he's cooler than he's letting on, too. He has a New York, he has a New Jersey State Trooper in this room who's his bodyguard. Are you allowed to identify him? Yeah. Well, I, I think he stands out. Right over there, he does stand out. <laughs> he gets to drive around in this really tripped out car with lights and sirens all day long. He talks to the governor. He, he's a lot cooler than he's letting on, but as he said, he's an introvert. <laughs> well, the, the coolest part was uh, when we had a meeting in Atlantic City for the first time. We had like a 9 o'clock meeting in Atlantic City, and I live by the Meadowlands up in the northern part of the state. And I said, how are we going to get there? And they're like, no, we'll just fly there. I'm like, really? We could fly down to Atlantic <laughs> City? And to go on the state police helicopter for the first time was pretty cool. And just to land right next to the casino, walk in. Oh, that's cool. You know, during your first month there, that's pretty cool, right? So, although I don't like to fly either. So. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Emily Krestic. And what does being the Attorney General mean to you? So I think for me, I mentioned it in my remarks, it means getting the opportunity to do the right thing for the right reasons every day, uh, to improving lives, to improving public safety, uh, and to making sure that, that every, everything that's happening in this state is, is being done the right way. Uh, that's really important to me, to, to set the bar at a very high level when it comes to how we treat our citizens, uh, how we perform our duties, uh, and to just really improve the, the, the law enforcement services that we're delivering to all our citizens to improve those interactions, uh, to make sure all of you are protected. Uh, and it makes, you know, I think that makes me satisfied. If I can go home saying that I moved the needle on those issues during my day in the office, that's what it means to me, improving lives and improving uh, the way we operate. Hi, my name is Richard and my question is, how do you persevere in spite of all the hate? So that's a really good question. The question was, how do you persevere despite all the hate that you receive? Um, so, so one thing uh, I, I unfortunately have, have had to develop throughout my life is some pretty thick skin. Um, you know, I, I grew up in, I was born and raised in New Jersey. I grew up at a time where uh, there weren't many other students who looked like me in my classes. And, and so I persevered through bullying and, and teasing and taunting, and, and I developed a pretty, pretty thick skin. Uh, and so when somebody now in this job says something to me that that you know is offensive, I, I just ignore it. You know, I just move on because I have too many important things to get done during my day. Uh, to get caught up and to internalize what somebody's saying to me uh, would just take away from my ability to to do good during my time uh, in my in the office. Uh, I have been on the other end of comments from radio show hosts, from on the other end of comments from elected officials, uh, and, I, and I just move beyond them because uh, that's more a reflection uh, on them uh, than on me. The other thing is, when I read a news story about my office, or when I go online to, to look at a story about my office, I never scroll down, right? I, at the bottom of all those news stories are public comments where people can say things, I scrolled down early on in my career. I don't scroll down now because the people who are commenting there really don't matter. Uh, and so uh, that's how I deal with, with, with the, the hate on a daily basis. And the other thing is I try to set the tone uh, in my office on how we're going to interact and treat people. And I try to elevate the discourse. I never go negative. Uh, I always try to keep it uh, you know, at a higher level. And I think. All of those who have platforms like us in office have to really elevate our discourse, meaning we've got to be responsible in the words we use. So that's how I deal with it. 
And just like you folks out here, when you have a bullying situation or somebody's coming after you, we do the same exact thing. We rely on each other. We know the people that matter. We turn to our families, we turn to our friends, and we talk about the issues. A lot of times, in order to preserve a defendant's right to a fair trial, we're not allowed to say very much out loud about a crime. And people will make things up and they will put it on social media and the newspaper, as the general said, and it's hard to read. But when you're secure in who you are, you can move past it. And while your first reaction is, I'm going to get back at this person, we just, we're calm, we're cool, we're collected, and you just kind of rise above. If you're secure in who you are and your faith, you, you rise above it and you talk to the people that you admire, that you respect. You know, whether I send him a text at three in the morning or, or during the middle of the day, we, we're there for each other, and that's very important. And I suggest that you do the same with your friends. Yeah, I mean, th those texts from the people that matter, they help you get through the, those, those negative incidents. And what's really pretty cool is like, if, you know, somebody in the, in the public space says something negative, hateful, or bigoted, or racist about me, uh, it's pretty cool that the governor comes out on TV and says, you know what? That's ridiculous. You got to cut this out. And so I will say to him, "Where were you when I was in high school?" You know, <laughs> I could have used you then. It's true. All right. So my name is Aditya. My question for you is: Has any life experience that you have had impacted the role that you play today, being an attorney general, and in which situation? Yeah, I think um, you know I glossed over it. Um, uh, it. You know, in the earlier remarks, but if you were going to ask me. Uh, what really motivated you to go into public service? What really pushed you uh, to become a, a federal prosecutor? Uh, to me, it was, it was the, uh, the events of September 11th. Uh, and you guys are all born in a generation, I think, after September 11th. Uh, and so you weren't alive when that happened, that horrible, horrible tragedy. And I was a lawyer in Washington, D.C., driving to work on that Tuesday morning uh, when I heard the news of the, the plane hitting the, the World Trade Center, and then there was news that there were planes circling Washington, D.C., uh, and a plane eventually hit the Pentagon, and that was right across the river from the law firm uh, where I was working. And as I was in the attorney lounge with all my colleagues looking at this tragedy unfold on television, uh, we were all trying to grieve together. But there came a point where I just didn't have the opportunity to grieve with my colleagues, where when I walked out on the street or where I walked into a, a shopping mall or, or a restaurant, I heard people sort of whispering. And then when I went to, to work the next day, I walked out on the street to go to lunch and I had a guy in the street just yell, look, I found him, there's been Laden, I caught him. And, and so this, this just built up and up and up and it just escalated to more and more sort of incidents like this and that's what really led me to believe that I needed to go into public service because I asked myself the question, why was it the case or how could it be the case that I was born in this country, I went to school here, I checked all the boxes, I played Little League, my mom was a soccer mom, that I could wake up one day where I'm made to feel completely un-American. And so to me, I needed to get into public service, to get in front of juries, to get in front of federal law enforcement officers, to explain that you could look different and still be American, that there is no one image of being American. And, and to me, that was the event that motivated me to public service, and that continues to motivate me to change perceptions while also do a tremendous amount of good for the rest of the state. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lena, and my question is, do you have fun at work? I, I get to take a helicopter every once in a while, so th no, the answer is, we, you know, Laura works with me, uh, and I, I, think I'm, I think I have a pretty good sense of humor, uh, pretty sarcastic, uh, so uh, we have a lot of fun at work, uh, and we have a lot of fun at work. It, it is, it is a, like I said, an incredibly difficult job, but it is so, so rewarding and to have a team that you could you know, sort of joke around with while you're really doing meaningful work. Uh, I'll give you one example, like of, of things that, that we get to do, which are rewarding and fun. So we, we have about 17,000 dreamers in New Jersey, right? There's an effort underway to remove those protections for our dreamers in New Jersey. And so there was a lawsuit brought in Texas 
by the Attorney General of Texas to repeal the DACA program, to take away those protections for our dreamers. And so the federal government was supposed to defend that lawsuit, but they weren't. We flew down to Texas, we intervened in that lawsuit, and we said to Texas, you've got to knock this off. You can't do this. You have 17,000 New Jerseyans who are affected by this. And the judge denied their motion. So we won that first fight. So that's rewarding, but that's, that was fun for me. I went down to Texas in a courtroom in, in Houston to argue a case to protect 17,000 people to let them live their lives or go to school for another day. I think it's incredibly rewarding, incredibly exciting. And in those five moments that we have when we have our brown bag lunches, we all have lunch together on Thursdays, we have a lot of fun too. I get to have an amazing amount of fun. Sometimes I'm dressed like this. In the back of my car, I got a bunch of other stuff because as the chief lawyer, I get to go to court, I get to watch trials, I get to figure out who we're gonna talk to, uh, how a case is progressing. But on the officer's side, where I'm the chief law enforcement officer, I also find that it's very important for me to be places to show our local police officers that I support them. So at three in the morning when I'm staring at the ceiling and I can't sleep and the text goes off that there's been an arson or something in Edison or elsewhere, I get to jump in my cop car and go with the lights and sirens up there and talk to these guys and lift the police tape. It feels like it's on a TV show. You're just like, what's going on there? Yeah, it sounds good. You should do that. <laughs> Check that out. Put that in a bag and I'll see you later. And the best part is when it's like eight degrees out, I get to go, bye, I'm going back to bed and everybody else does their job. Yeah. We also, we work with some just incredible people and multiple times during a day, we'll meet at a conference table and we'll go around the room. What do you think? What more can we do? If this person in the community is concerned, let's bring them in, let's talk to them, let's try to see what we can do to make this place better. So we deal with the emergencies, but we also try to stand back and say, what can we be doing better to help keep everybody safe? And that's the best part of the job. He's, he's got a different idea of fun, right? <laughs> I remember as a county prosecutor, they, they called me at two in the morning and they said, boss, you have to come to this homicide scene. Uh, and they left the yellow tape and, and I peered in and I almost got sick. <laughs> and I said, look, step to me, and I left. <laughs> Question. That's a great question. So, you know, the, the legislature uh, obviously makes the laws. Um, we have a, a tremendous amount of input. The legislature respects our views when it comes to laws that affect law enforcement and criminal justice issues. Uh, so we're always consulted, but ultimately it's the legislature that passes those laws. But we have a, a really good relationship in New Jersey between our lawmakers and law enforcement. So they talk to our county prosecutors, they talk to me, uh, when it comes to those types of laws. Uh, the other thing, um, while they're not laws, I, I talked earlier about policies, and so they, they almost have the effect of law when it comes to law enforcement. So I have the ability to really go to the office one day and just say, you know what, today I feel like making all the cops in the state do this. I don't do that, but that's you know also almost a quasi rulemaking or lawmaking uh, authority, but we exercise that uh, very responsibly. Um, what previous jobs did you have before becoming attorney general? Okay, so um, the, the previous jobs that I had, uh, when I was in college, I, I worked for a, a senator uh, on, in Washington, D.C. I went to Georgetown, so I worked for a senator because I was interested in government at an early age. Uh, after that, I worked for a newspaper, and, and that was probably the coolest job I had because I got paid every day to go to work and I'd pick up all the newspapers from all across the country that were delivered to the office, bring them upstairs, and then I got to just read newspapers for three hours. This is before the internet and you could do internet research and I had to cut out articles. So if it was an article on uh, a, a policy issue, I would cut it out, glue it on a piece of paper and put it in a filing cabinet and I got paid about $15 an hour to do that. So that was pretty cool. Uh, after that, uh, I went to law school. After law school, I worked at a big firm. I worked for one of the biggest law firms in Washington, D.C. for about four or five years. That's where I was when I was answering that question uh, about September 11th. 
But that's when I decided to leave private practice and I went to the U.S. Attorney's Office to become a federal prosecutor in New York, then New Jersey, then county prosecutor, now Attorney General. That's it. One failure uh, as a teenager and how I overcame it. Uh, gosh, I'm going to give it to Andrew while I think about that. <laughs> Not one thing comes to mind, but we all make mistakes. Yeah. And you have to recognize that. We try to do our best every single day, and we try to make things better every single day, but you're going to make a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes. Cops are not superheroes. We are not superheroes. The most important thing to do is, is to know when you make a mistake, own it. One of the reasons, one of the things that's most frustrating to me when I deal with somebody in law enforcement, when there's been a mistake made, if there's a lie that follows, I can't help them. If they come in and say, I made a mistake, okay, we can deal with a mistake. What I can't deal with is when you throw away your credibility, your integrity, and who you are, because at that point, nobody's gonna believe you at all and you're eighth graders nothing comes to mind but i guarantee you on a weekly basis i did something that, that embarrassed myself whether i tripped in the hall or snotted myself in class we all did that so well while we look very professional at this very moment uh, we were all in your chairs so you can overcome it and one little thing it's a bump in the road look down the line sometimes we tend to focus on that little thing we can't see past it there's always tomorrow, there's always the next day. Think about, in your life, something that embarrassed you horribly maybe a year ago. And today, it doesn't even matter. And that's life. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't think of any one thing that jumps out, but to Andrew's point, you will make mistakes, own them, learn from them, and move on from them. And I think that's a philosophy you should have. Um, but I can't. I wish I had these questions ahead of time. I could have come up with a, a long list of, of things. We all do stupid things, and, and as kids, and we have to move on from them and learn from them and not, uh, like he said, cover them up. And, it, and the way you respond to making a mistake is a true measure of who you are. There's a lot of old children running around. If you are responsible, try to make something negative into a positive. That's it. If you have a problem, how can you learn from it, move forward, teach somebody about it, and make it into a positive? Thank you. Oh, those are all the questions. Yeah. All right. Do we want Excellent. to take any from the audience? Are we allowed to? Sure, we can take some from mm. the audience. All right. Absolutely. These are the unscripted ones, right? These are the unscripted ones. Yeah, come on up. Healed him, he dropped his crutch. And I have a question related to the opioid crisis. What steps will you take to combat the opioid crisis, and what steps will you take for legalizing marijuana? Okay, so this question was what steps will we take uh, to deal with the opioid crisis, and what steps will we take to legalize marijuana? So, on the opioid crisis, I think, and Andrew could uh, talk about what he's doing in, in his office. But we're focusing on, on a couple of things. We're focusing on prevention, that we are getting the message out there to young people about the different paths to addiction. Uh, we're talking to our doctors about prescribing more responsibly so people don't get hooked to these powerful drugs. And I think the message to each of you in this room is that there will no doubt be times when you have a sports injury or where you, have, uh, you go to a doctor but I think you should ask your doctor about the drugs they prescribe. I think you are old enough now to have that conversation to say, hey, is there something less powerful that you can give me? Uh, because these are really powerful drugs. And, and when they're over-prescribed, there's an opportunity for abuse. So the prevention side of it is one. For those who are already in the throes of addiction who are suffering, we're offering treatment. Uh, we are really focusing on initiatives where we can take folks out of the criminal justice system and put them in the treatment system to get them the help that they need to, to overcome this addiction instead of just being in a cycle of being arrested, overdosing, rearrested, And so the treatment is important. On the enforcement side, we are locking up bad guys who are pushing these drugs regardless of whether they're in the boardroom on the pharmaceutical companies or in the exam room when it comes to medical doctors or, 
for, for indiscriminately prescribing these drugs, or on the street corners. We're locking up those pushers who are putting this deadly poison on our streets. So it's prevention, treatment, and enforcement. And the general just made available a million dollars throughout the state to help us with the opioid crisis. Here in Middlesex, we're going to launch a program that's a takeoff of what the general did in Bergen County. We're going to do our own version of Operation Helping Hand. We're going to have cops, medical people, opioid people, addiction specialists, and people that are recovering to try to target the families of the addicted in order to get them immediate help. So we're trying to look forward, what more can we do? And the cops that are on the streets, the cops that are administering, you've heard of Narcan, which brings you back from an overdose of heroin. The cops who see those people every day, they want to do more. So I appreciate the general funding and effort for us to be able to do more as we work with the community. And then on, on the marijuana piece, uh, somebody was asking about what the roles we have in, 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 in making laws. That's the legislature. They are the ones who are now contemplating whether to legalize marijuana or not legalize marijuana. Uh, regardless of what they decide, if they legalize it, it will not be for you. Uh, it will be adult use. Uh, and, and the most important message is that all of this stuff you don't need. You don't need it, uh, and it all leads you to the same place. I have sat with too many folks who are now addicted to heroin who started with marijuana. They might have used it at a party and somebody put a pill in front of them and that pill led to another pill that led to heroin. And it, it is something that you guys don't need if you want to be upstanding citizens. I mean, it is, it is just all fraught with peril at your age and at any age for that matter. Yeah. Hello, um, hello. Um, my, my name is um, hello, my name is Desmond Singh, and I'd like to joke with you as well. Um, I'm, my question is, um, since you have like a lot of work and responsibilities, do you get like enough sleep and rest? <laughs> no. Yeah, uh, that, that's a great question. I, I don't sleep enough. In addition to all the responsibilities that I have, the most resp important responsibility uh, that I have is my family. Uh, I'm married and I have three little girls, uh, and so no matter how long my day is, I have to always go home and make sure that I have time uh, for each of them, and then also time for myself. Uh, and so that means family time when I get home. It also means getting up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning to go to the gym to make sure I exercise every day and keep in shape, because otherwise uh, this, this job can get the best of you. So uh, I try to sleep about four, four and a half to five hours, which is not nearly enough. Um, but I wish I could sleep more on the weekends. Uh, but no. I'm a soccer dad on Saturday. So, so we'd love to take more okay. questions, but we have to go to some classes today. Class. Why don't we just get oh. oh. Wait, should we get rid of class for the day? Yeah. Yeah. Now you're becoming I, 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 think, I think we can make that law happen right now. <laughs> No, I want to listen. I want to thank you guys for having me, uh, and, and Prosecutor Kerry. Uh, I want to wish you guys all good luck as you try to be good citizens. And, and remember what I said earlier: both of us started off in seats like yours. Anything is possible for you guys if you just do what we told you, which is just really, you know, cherish your reputations, work hard, and make sure that you treat each interaction with each other, and with your family, and with your friends, and with your principals. And, and treat that interaction and try to do it as well as you can every time. Yep. So if you ever want to run for public office, I think you just got all of their votes for canceling class possibly for the rest of the day. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, grade, we're gonna stay seated. Okay, until we dismiss, and we're going to dismiss by row, but before we all leave and dismiss, I just want to give another round of applause to our guests today. It is not every day that you get to ask questions and interact with the Attorney General of New Jersey, so we thank General Gray Wall for coming and Prosecutor Andrew Terry for coming as well to speak to you about some of their life lessons. And hopefully you thought about some of the problems in our community that you want to tackle with Project Citizen, which is going to be coming up in your social studies class. So thank you again for being a good audience. Another round of applause for our guests. Thank you.